Good afternoon. And to those of you at the West Coast, Alaska, or Hawaii, good morning. Uh, my name is Min, Min Lei. Um, I'm the Division Director for Research Capacity Building at NIGMS. And I am your host today. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the fifth webinar of the NIGMS Training Webinar se Series. <clears throat> this is a difficult time. The pandemic has uh, disrupted everybody's life to a certain extent. NIGMS created this webinar series to help keep our training community together with useful and interesting talks and conversations. And I hope you are all enjoying them. <clears throat> A few reminders before we start the presentation. Uh, all webinars in this series are recorded and uh, some of them already has been and all of them will be posted on the NIGMS website. So you can view them, actually all of them at any time. And I would encourage you to ask your friends to uh, view them at the, uh, when they have a time. Secondly, uh, there will be a Q&A session after the presentation. To ask the question, we ask you to type it in the chat box and send it to me, and I will read it out for you. And again, my name is Ming, M-I-N-G, Lei, L-E-I. Just find my name and send it. And our speaker today is Dr. Susan Gregory, because she will share her scientific journey with you. So I'm not going to introduce her, except by uh, sharing with you that uh, as the NIH Associate Director for Data Science, she is the leader at the center of all NIH data science activities. So with that, Susan, take it away. Thank you so much, Ming, and to all my friends at NIGMS. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Just a little reality check, Ming. You hear me okay, correct? Yes. Awesome. Um, I've been so excited and looking forward to this particular uh, journey and discussion with you for a week. It's not often that I get to tell young people about my own personal journey, and I hope that you see yourself in a little bit of me and what I've done. I'm going to tell you about what I've done in the computational sciences, which is my true love, and how this has helped shape biomedicine and my own personal professional choices. So let me begin by telling you the beginning. So um, I want to give you some historical uh, perspective in the development of computers, computer science, the internet. I actually watched the internet's birth, more or less, networking and analysis and my own personal journey and how these have changed my professional life and, and have helped me make my career choices. And then I wanna finish on something that's relevant to every single one of us around the world. How have we applied computing, internet, technologies, analytics to address COVID-19? And we're just at the start of COVID-19. So we have a long ways to go. So we're gonna to have to go way back um, in the way back machine to 1980s. So the top song of 1982 is Physical by Olivia Newton-John, which you may or may not have ever heard, but I'm sure you have seen the movie E.T. It was the top grossing movie in, um, in uh, 1982. And I'm living somewhere in a town in Michigan, and I'm a dancer. I actually take ballet as well as Highland dancing. I am a total goof off. I um, probably am in and out of school more than, more than most. I'm a DJ at our local high school radio station. My name is Susie at that time. I'm the homecoming queen and I'm a total closet geek. Nobody at my high school knows that I'm an avid reader of science fiction. I'm, I'm reading uh, Scientific America, which was about at my level in high school. I'm taking classes at the local community college, mostly in genetics and chemistry. I'm really fascinated with science, but um, I had a sick, that was my secret life. And here's what, computing looked like to me in 1980. So popular then was the Commodore 64. I came from a community in a town where computers were not very common. So even my high school did not have any computers, um, but the local community college did. 
this is a typical computer science room um, that um, I never got to visit when I was in high school. But I'm pretty familiar with these. <laughs> and if you um, have never seen these before, these are punch cards. And so when you write a computer program in 1980s and before, um, you have to translate them into the punch card system. And then you feed those punch cards into a machine that's not really um, quite visible in my picture. And the worry of every computer scientist um, at that time was that you drop those punch cards because they're in, they're in order, they're a program and they're in order. And if you drop those punch cards, you will spend a significant amount of time and um, worry trying to get them back in order. Just imagine trying to debug your program using a punch card system. It was so hard to do um, so much work. And when I was in high school, this was one of the uh, computational biology highlights of 1982. By the way, 1982 is the year that I graduated from high school. This is the story of the protein dynamics of a small little tiny protein called BPTI, bovine pancreatic trypsin inhibitor. It's approximately 60 amino acids long and you can see its ribbon structure on the screen. Um, Wilfred van Gusen, Gusen and Martin Karplis did molecular dynamic trajectories of this little tiny pro protein for 25 picoseconds in vacuum. And then they put it in a spherical um, shell of uh, 2,647 2, nonpolar waters. And then they fixed it in a crystal structure. And they tried to understand the dynamics and movement of this protein in these three scenarios. And that particular paper and that particular simulation was a tour de force of computational biology the year I graduated from high school. And I was totally amazed that we could um, actually do calculations of proteins dynamics um, in these three different um, scenarios in vacuum, in nonpolar solvent, and in crystal image. So moving a little bit forward in the later 1980s, the top song is Walk Like an Egyptian. That was the song when I was in college as an undergraduate. The top grossing movie of 1987 is Three Men and a Baby, actually a movie I never saw. That's not quite my interest. And I am at the University of Michigan. And I'm an undergraduate and I graduate in the year 1987. I'm a chemistry major and a math major. It's not uncommon for probably for most of you to have dual majors. I am a research assistant. I'm a research assistant in mathematics. I'm a research assistant in geology, and I'm also a research assistant in the medical school where I'm um, developing hepatic imaging agents um, through synthetic organic chemistry, and that is not my strength. And I do not do any more synthetic organic chemistry after undergraduate, but um, at that time, I thought that would be an interesting type of research to explore. I'm also spending lots and lots of time looking for errors in my code. I want to just make one point to you, as you, many of you are undergraduates. One of the most valuable experiences that you can gain as an undergraduate is to work in a lab. To work in a lab, to work with graduate students, to work with uh, other graduate students, to work with uh, postdoctoral researchers, and your mentor, your PI mentor, will allow you to see what research is really like. You know, it's hard. Sometimes you spend a lot of time working on a project and it doesn't go anywhere. There's a lot of false starts. This is one of the most valuable real life learning experiences that you can have. And I encourage everybody to take at least one semester and do research in a laboratory. And obviously, I am no longer a closet geek. I am an actual geek at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm known in, mostly in the chemistry and math department, but I do have a lot of work that I do in um, coding as well. And what does computers look like for me when I'm an undergraduate? <clears throat> This is one of the computers that I worked on. Um, it's not my actual computer because I didn't take that with me. This is an IBM PC2, and you can see that you can actually play chess on this computer. This is the um, Ohio State University, a big competitor to Michigan, by the way. This is their supercomputing center in 1987. Um, they are a powerhouse of, of supercomputing. They are not the only ones, but um, I knew them well. And this is the birth of programming languages dynamic, you know, 
well, you probably have heard of Fortran. That was my, my primary language when I was um, coding in the late 80s. <clears throat> um, C++ certainly, but Perl and these more interpretive and dynamic languages um, really start developing in the late 80s. What's the a computational highlight um, from the year I graduated from college, which was 1987, is a, another computer simulation. This is the diffusion of a substrate in an active site in an enzyme. And this particular system is superoxide dismutase. Um, and what I wanted to show you was that Unlike the last simulation, which is the dynamics um, in a trajectory sort of way, these are more stochastic Brownian dynamic simulations. And what was really super cool about um, Kim, Kim Sharp and Barry Honing and um, Robert Fine's work is that they actually put the charges in the active site of the enzyme into the calculation. And having the ability to have molecules have a charge gives you an electrostatic for what's really happening in that active site. And to me, this was just a super cool simulation. Um, I love the work of Barry Hunt and I followed him for years. And I, and I have watched the field of electrostatic calculations go from point charges to um, probability charges um, to all sorts of really innovative work. And so I just wanted to share with you that one particular highlight. Moving to a new decade, 1990. The top song in 1995 is Gangsta Paradise by Coolio um, featuring LV. And the top movie, which I did see, is Batman Forever. All those Batman movies are so great. And I'm at the University of Maryland. And obviously, I have never left um, this area. I am still living in Silver Spring today. I am defending my PhD thesis in 1995. Just a side note. I took two years off between my um, undergraduate and my graduate studies, and I worked at the Naval Research Laboratory, where I was um, involved in the, in the um, physical characterization of organic molecules used for blood surrogates. And that was a really wonderful experience because I got to see what it was like to work in a very large team at the Naval Research Laboratory, and I got to um, become much more proficient in NMR spectroscopy and um, IR spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy, and I so loved Raman and IR spectroscopy that you'll see it popping up in my future. You see this character here on the giant steps. That's my PhD thesis advisor. That's Millard Alexander. He's still at the University of Maryland. I think he might be emeritus at this point, but what did we work on? So I studied um, flux in reactive systems, systems like um, boron, hy boron hydride, and I studied what happens in those systems um, when the potential energy that describes different um, excitation states cross? And how do you actually calculate curve crossing or reactions? And that's really the story of flux. I developed a new genetic algorithm, which is a pretty cool algorithm for optimization of structures that have multiple, multiple potential energy surfaces, PSEs. And obviously, I am not in computational biology. I am a serious home brewer. And I got married to my um, colleague in physics. And this is a kind of a later picture, but that is myself and my husband, Nicholas Phillips. When I was um, a graduate student, I, I wanted to change careers. I wanted to think differently about um, computation and, and what we can do with our careers. So I changed from physics to computational biology. Here's what computers look like in the 1990s. This is actually a computer that I did my, most of my PhD work on. It's an Apple Macintosh. I was so lucky to watch the birth of Mozilla, Netscape, and a little blurry for you is um, the HTML language that most of you probably know how to program in and you're very, very efficient in. But when I was in grad school, this was completely new. And so was this. Um, at one point, there were a list every day came out a new website and there was a list of the top websites that have come out that day and the first uh, webcam that's the coffee pot at cambridge where i actually visited and did some work as a grad student there it is you could see the level of the coffee pot um, at any particular time and then you would know when you could go down and get some new coffee and here i want to play for you in the wayback machine is a sound that i will never forget coming. There it is.
and that horrible sound goes on and on. That is how I had to connect to the internet. That is my dial-up modem. <laughs> so I'd have to sit at home and timeshare the one computer in our, in our grad school house, dial up to the internet and do our work. And most of us actually <laughs> played games and we had to have a lot of time in order to do our work and play games. So you guys have such a wonderful experience. Um, always connected, always on, but for us, that was the sound that we heard hour after hour now throughout the night. Here's something that um, was super exciting um, when I was early in my graduate school days. This is BLAST, the Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, um, developed by um, a number of colleagues, including David Lipman. David Lipman is still at NL NCBI and NLM here at NIH. This was a new approach to rapidly do sequence compa comparison of different um, sequences by doing a basic alignment. And you would get a score and that would tell you, for example, where the gaps were, where the insertions were. Um, this particular algorithm has revolutionized the way we do comparative genomics. And now you can do um, PsyBlast and multi-PI blast. And there's just so much work that's happened. Um, but yet I bet most of you have used BLAST or one of its um, child prodigies in your own research. And um, it was just remarkable. And this is really one of the reasons that I got inspired to think about bioinformatics and data science, because I started to realize um, when I was in physics that the world of data and the world of biology and the world of computing were the next big thing. And I think that you might agree that that's actually true. In the years since 1995, I have trans did a, um, a travel to Israel for a postdoctorship in computational biology. I was a professor of computational biology at a university, University of Maryland, Baltimore County for a number of years. And one of the projects that I worked on was this super large um, protein complex called GROW-EL, GROW-ES. That is a protein chaperone complex and it's huge. It's 14 subunits that you can't see at all. It's all together as a big complex. Each subunit is 58 kilodaltons. I couldn't even load that complex into memory in my computer when I was working. I had to do um, parallel, very large parallel processing on supercomputers to just do the calculations for how the Groyel chaperone, um, Groyel chaperone, Groyel chaperone complex, and the proteins that inside that are inside that are in blue um, actually work. I switched. I um, became a program director for the Department of Energy. And I focused fully and totally on data, data platforms, data computing for energy and the environment, very particularly on bioenergy, translating um, poplar and other types of soft woody plants into bioenergy complexes. Um, I decided to make that career change because I wanted to have a bigger impact for a larger amount of science and I truly, truly am dedicated to data science. I was a division director at NIGMS and I worked for Dr. John Morris and I was the director of biophysics, biomedical technology and computational biosciences. And I really wanted to think about how we can change the landscape for technology, incorporating much more new and innovative technology as well as new ideas for team science. And now I am the data associate director for data science where I'm working across NIH and across the community to make data, data resources findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And I also am the mother of two fantastic young adults, Andrew Phillips, who is a junior in college studying, of all things, organic chemistry, <laughs> and my daughter, Abigail Phillips, who is um, finishing high school and hoping someday to have a career in dance. I still brew beer. Almost every month I have another five gallon carboy of beer brewing. And here we are today. You have data at your fingertips and you have wonderful platforms to access and use that data. You're always connected and you're always on and that's a wonderful thing. And maybe it's a, a curse too, but it's, it's so nice to never have to listen to that dial up sound. You have supercomputers um, like we've never seen before that can really address problems of great complexity. The problem I showed you of Groyel, Groyel's a chaperone complex could easily be handled today without any um, special workarounds with massive parallel computing. You have R and it's shiny. <laughs> and you write in codelets that you can match right onto the bare metal with Kubernetes. And you can package up your code into dockers and containers and move it around to different cloud resources. 
and you're working on a community, you have GitHub, you share your software. This is just an example of Jupyter, but there's such a great software sharing community um, that's available to you. So how can we use all these tools that we have at our hands today to address a pandemic that's significant? How can we partner with industry for workflows and tools and analysis? And how can we provide you the resources so that you can get your work done? I wanna just give you um, three or four use cases of what we're doing right now at NIH that you can use to study COVID-19. And the first one, and this is an amazing story of two intramural researchers, one of them from NIDDK and the other from NCI. So um, NCI's National Cancer Institute, NIDDK is um, Digestive um, Kidney uh, Institute. And they, in three weeks, collected specimens from pathology, created the digital um, images of those specimens, uh, de-identified them, uh, partnered with a company called Halo, and put those um, whole slide images up for you to use for reference so that you can study and understand COVID-19. Right now, um, we have uh, much more than eight reference cases because our two intramural researchers are getting more and more samples every day from hospitals from different countries. So I think we're up to 19 um, reference cases, but there's more coming in every day. And we're going to integrate this particular resource into a much larger resource in the near future. But just right now, you can go and do um, some limited artificial intelligence algorithm development on these own resources. And we're partnering with the gaming um, a NVIDIA company to create processing workflows for um, CT images. CT has been one of the um, types of images that you can use to detect COVID-19 in patients. And so we're developing those workflows by using and leveraging gaming computers. This is a very nice um, artificial intelligence um, classification. And we are providing high performance computing resources um, to the federal government, to industry, to academic leaders around the world so that you can use resources from the national labs, resources from IBM, from Google, from AWS. Over 4 million CPU cores are available. Um, the consortium is taking applications every day. So if you have an idea that you think would benefit from high performance computing, this consortium is there. The resources are free for you. We've come a long way um, since those days of punch cards and the 25 picosecond dynamic simulations of tiny, tiny proteins. And I'm just wondering where you, um, our new and brightest generation of scientists, will take us in the future. And with that, um, I would love to hear from you, your questions, your comments, and your thoughts. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ming. Thank you. Thank you so much. For the, I will say with uh, computers, beer, and the lovely family, that's a very, very exciting life. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have questions while waiting for, for questions from the audience. I will ask the first one on behalf of our audience, our students, let's say. All right. So. Um, for a biology major interested in uh, a research career, what would be the key uh, computational and data science training or skills that the student should pick up while uh, he or she is in school? That is a great question, Ming. Um, I would say that um, there are a few common ways in which biology is coming to, to look at data, um, and look at studies um, that you can start to take classes in now. And that would include um, getting familiar with the programming language R because quite a few um, software tools are written for and in R. But if that's a bit of a barrier, and there are also um, tools such as Galaxy, which, which are a little bit more plug and play. And so using the tools available in Galaxy or in Jupyter, um, you can have a lot of different types of, of computational software like BLAST and others. Um, so getting familiar with those platforms and learning to use those tools and understand what the results mean for your research would be a great step forward. And Coursera is offering many different types of computational um, classes available um, for students. And I think NIH has offerings to make uh, Coursera computational data science classes freely available for um, NIH uh, students. So we'll be more than happy to um, point you to those resources. Great. 
Great. So there is actually a question uh, from one of the students. Where would I go to apply for access to computer resources? Ah, from the HPC Consortium. <laughs> there is a website um, and the, the application is um, processed through NSF through a um, program called XSEED. X -S -E -E -D. I think I don't know if there's an E at the end of that, but it's an NSF will um, route your application um, to the consortium uh, and the proposal is very lightweight. It's only, I believe, three pages. Um, so you can certainly easily apply for those resources and then they will um, match you, the resource needs to the application that you've put in. So you can have access to many different types of resources. And I think related to that, uh, we have, uh, NIH has some training opportunities and resources available as well, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Let me see if my um, slide goes. There are a number of different um, training opportunities that um, I did prepare as an extra slide, um, including our um, uh, sorry, Metadata Cloud BigQuery and our NIAID Bioinformatics Training Resource. Um, all of the resources that I told you about today can be found on our website, including the uh, high performance computing um, application. And then there's a number of training opportunities that we will be having available, um, including if you really, really want to do computing on bare metal, there's a Kubernetes engine um, two day course coming up later this month. There's a number of other opportunities in the works um, that could be either working with Google, GP, GCP, or AWS. Um, some new opportunities for machine learning, as well as um, data engineering later in July. Great. Um, another question is more about your own scientific journey, right? How did you decide to change your field? And how did you update yourself with the new field? That is a great question. Um, and it's sort of a funny story. I was studying um, physics and mostly in surface and um, gas phase physics. And the funding was starting to change when I was a grad student from that physics Silicon Valley type of um, funding much more into bioinformatics. And my PhD thesis advisor said, you know, there are a few opportunities in your life when you can do a career change. Um, and from graduate to school to postdoc is one of them. If you want to make a change to, to computational biology, because you saw all the articles I was reading, now is the time you need to do it. So I wrote to a number of people um, to, to get specifically training um, from people who were prior physicists who had moved to computational biology. And that is how I chose my postdoc was by working with somebody who had also been a physicist so that we would have some common language. Um, it was a hard change. I had taken very, very little biology classes um, when I was an undergrad and obviously no biology classes when I was a grad student. So I had a huge lift um, to train, retrain myself I was lucky that my um, postdoctoral advisor was very patient with me um, as I did have to take additional training and coursework in biology in particular. And I will be the first to admit that um, I do not have the strength and background that many of my colleagues at NIGMS have in biology. And I often have to look to them for understanding about the meaning of, 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 the, of the systems that I'm trying to study in much more complex detail than I have. Biology is so complicated, but it's also so fascinating. Great. Uh, the follow-up actually is like follow-up question from a different, the opposite angle, right? Do you have advice for postdocs not classically trained in data computational science wanting to transition into the field? Yes, absolutely. I would take the similar thought that um, working with a, um, an advisor uh, or doing a one-year sabbatical as a junior uh, assistant professor with a colleague who has that training in wet lab um, experimentation but has also made a transition to computation um, will help you a lot. So you might need to take an additional year postdoc or um, sabbatical to, to train in computational sciences, but um, working hands-on in a lab with other people in the computational field will give you a lot of insight. I also took apart a lot of code um, to learn how it worked. <laughs> and that is a good way to learn how something works is to take it apart and then try to learn how to put, 
put it back together again. Okay, here, this is a closely related one. What are the computational bioinformatics opportunities as a prospective postdoc at the NIH? Ah, so um, uh, there are a number of um, computational uh, fellowships that one can apply for. Um, there's also a lot of um, funding for new investigators in the computational data science. And you happen to be um, looking at the institute that has, I'd say, the largest amount of computational and data science um, funding opportunities, NIGMS. Um, and so working with them and to, um, to get funding in one of their programs is absolutely a wonderful opportunity. Good. Um, another one related to this, what level of math and the statistic would you need to be, uh, to, to be able to take advantage of this bioinformatic tools you mentioned earlier? I would say that um, having a good basic understanding of mathematics and statistics um, will always help you. In fact, um, when I was looking at majors when I was in college, um, I was thinking of double majoring in computer science in my um, one of my colleagues told me that it's much better to major in math because math is the foundation of most computer science, and it's true. I see that now. Um, so having a strong mathematics background can never do you wrong, but if um, there's a little barrier, then having a good foundation for statistics um, will definitely be a, a very important tool to have in your toolbox. Another one. Um what program, uh, programming language will be suitable to understand the computational biology? Oh my goodness, I have so many favorites, <laughs> um, but probably they're a little old and outdated now. And what I see is that people find um, R and R Shiny to be very um, useful. And many, many of our, our professional PIs are writing their programs in R. So if I had to pick one, it would be R. But if you ask me what my favorite programming language is, it's actually Perl. I loved Perl so much. I did not like Java very much. Um, and I certainly didn't like many of the threading languages, but I just absolutely love Perl, but I don't think that's very useful. I think R is probably going to be your best bet. Great. OK. What would be your advice with gaining computational skills you, you want to incorporate into research rather than enter the field as a whole? What would be the best way for undergrad to approach a potential mentor? Okay, let me see if I can. Um, so you want to approach a mentor and gain experience. Um, I'm trying to understand how, how, to, how to parse that. The first um, part is an advice to gain computational skills. Uh, you want to incorporate into research, but not really want to become like a card carrying um, uh, a data scientist. Ah, okay. So um, I would say um, learning some of the more popular um, software tools like Blast, for example, um, is a great tool. Just learning how to use it and what those results mean for your own research would probably do you very well. So you will never have to write any or much code at all um, using existing software, but um, it will really help you if you sort of know the basics and know um, the results and know the foundation of, of some of those more popular tools. Okay, here is a specific one. Which tools would you recommend for crowd EM image processing to determine protein structures? I think, you know, by, and I am not an expert in that, but I think there are some tools, something like Cryolon is one tool that I've heard, um, and I believe that's been ported to um, the cloud, and actually I believe that NVIDIA worked on that as well um, for Cryo EM. There are probably other more popular and better tools. That's just one that I know about, and I know it um, mostly because of the partnership with NVIDIA. Okay. There is, there is also a pretty specific question that is, does NIH has a, a open resource for services such as a sequencing um, uh, pay, samples from patients? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, 
are, um, and this um, may or may not be available to the open community, but um, our institute, NHGRI, um, our Human Genomic Resource Institute, does do sequencing on patients, um, uh, particularly also right now for COVID-19, as well as um, we have a national lab in Frederick, Maryland, Frederick National Lab, which is doing sequencing on COVID-19 patients, as well as developing serology testing and analyzing that data. Oh, I see that. Um, CryoSpark is another popular uh, cryo-EM data processing tool, so thank you so much. Um, that must be Marianne Wu who has mentioned that. So okay. thank you very much. CryoSpark is um, coming up as another popular tool. All right. So let's go uh, for another question. Uh, given that uh, sectors such as uh, banking, insurance, often offer much higher salary, uh, to students with that kind of uh, uh, with computation and data science training, what would you tell them, tell those students uh, so that they would consider biomedical research as a rewarding and viable career uh, choice, choice? That's a great question because it's always, um, you know, on my mind as well. I would say that do, ha, being an investigator and a researcher in computational biology and studying and understanding biology is rewarding for a number of reasons, the flexibility that you have in your career and your career choices and the types of work that you do, those are up to you. You make the decisions and you are the captain of your ship and you make the contributions to science. Um, unlike in the private industry where the captain of the ship is the CEO and the, and the board of directors and they make a lot of the decisions and, and you are um, implementing. Here, when you're a researcher and an academic, um, setting, you are the one who is discovering and, and pushing the field forward. And if that passion for understanding, addressing questions, using your skills in computer science or in the wet lab drives you, you will stay up day and night to do it. You will, you will find that the, the passion you have for research will not be quenched by any um, lack of um, money that you may not have by not having moved to industry. All right. What are some of the big issues you're working on as the NIH Associate Director for Data Science? Right now, the biggest issue we're working on is with respect to COVID-19, and that is that we have to very rapidly create and move an infrastructure to get the data and the information to scientists in such a way that they can use their algorithms to answer really important questions. Data science requires data but it requires data to be well formatted, to be well curated, to be annotated, to be in um, a common model so that we can look across many different organizations. And that's what we're working on right now. And we're spending all of our days, most of our nights and even our weekends, um, and not just me and many people at NIH to move the data into a way that researchers can use it right now. Good. Um, which language do you think is best? one should start learning if she does not have any knowledge of programming language prior to that? I think the best one to um, begin with is still probably working in R. Um, I learned Fortran, they don't even teach that anymore um, in, in college. C++ underlies many of the programming languages that are used, so that's always a good language to learn, especially if you want to be a heavy-hitting um, computer science person. But um, if you're looking to pick something up and be pretty proficient quickly, I, I do recommend looking at R. Is there a specific platform that is better to take com computer science courses online, like Coursera or Adami? I'm sorry if I botched the, the, the names because I'm not familiar with them. And is one better than the other? I'm much more familiar with Coursera and we have um, developed a partnership with them so that we can um, provide training for a large number of uh, colleagues. So that is the one that um, I personally know the best uh, and would recommend, but there probably are others. I, my son is very fond of the Khan, KAHN Academy, um, and he, he's been taking a lot of courses um, 
throughout his, even when he was in high school through CAD. <laughs> here, here's some, uh, uh, one question requires some um, physician training, Susan. With the transition from in-person to online, what would you recommend for preventing your eyes from tiring during, due to staring at screens for a long time? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I'm, I don't know if I'm qualified to say or not, but I guess um, my strategy is to take lots of micro breaks <laughs> um, because I can certainly understand what you're saying uh, in terms of eye strain and just uh, also sitting down all day is not so good either. Um, so micro, my personal recommendation, and I'm not a physician at all, I'm a computer person, I like to take micro breaks. <laughs> and I think you have a brewer to take, to take care of, right? I do, yes. <laughs> Does NIH work with the big tech companies? Oh, indeed, yes, we do. We have um, partnerships um, through our Strides program with Google and AWS. We partner with Palantir, um, which is a very large um, analytics platform. We partner with NVIDIA, um, which is sort of a gaming chip developing company. Um, we partner with um, smaller companies. I don't know if Halo is super small, but that's a, the platform that we put the website up on. Um, so we do partner with a number of tech companies. Um, we've talked to a number of folks who are in the AI space to look at partnerships. We partner with the national labs and with other agencies such as NSF. Um, we're looking to partner with agency, uh, sister agencies such as the VA. You know, that's how science moves forward is to work together. Each Partnership offers strengths, and we have a strength too. We don't duplicate each other's work. We partner, and together we move science forward. Do you recommend any data science boot camps for more structured training? I have to say that um, I have a colleague uh, who is in my office. Her name is um, Alyssa Dillman, and she runs a number of codeathons and boot camps. Um, and so I would love to. Um, encourage you to take one of her boot camps and um, in order to see which one is running you have to go to my website and I just now see that we did not put it up there um, but um, if you go to the data science um, nih.gov website um, you'll be able to find the boot camps that we're running uh, I've done a number of jamborees and boot camps in my past and I've always loved the ones that focused on writing um, analytic tools for sequence analysis and pathway um, metabolic pathway analysis. Those are my personal favorites, but there, she runs boot camps on sequence analysis. She runs boot camps on um, understanding electronic healthcare record data. I mean, she just runs so many very different types of boot camps that I, I would say that um, attending one of her boot camps would probably be a lot of fun. And she's young um, and much more in tune with where the computer science um, is going than me who have, I haven't coded in more than, I don't know, 10 years now, I think. All right, here, um, I'm interested in learning Python. Do you have any advice on how I should learn? I only have some, exp I only have some experience with working on R. Yeah, Python. <laughs> um, I can just tell you my strategy for how I learned um, was to get code, take it apart, and then um, work with it put in new subroutines, new algorithms, and see if I could get it to do something new. Um, and that's how I um, help my son learn programming. Um, so I would suggest if you're interested in Python, um, get some codes written in Python from GitHub and see if you can play around with it. But there's, a gr there's great books by O'Reilly on sort of understanding computer code at a little um, easier level. And I would also get the, one of the O'Reilly books, the Python um, book is particularly fun. We have that at our house. I'm interested in bioinformatics with a biology background. I don't have any physics background. If I want to know more about the physics, where should I start? That's a great question. There are a lot of um, sort of um, primers that you can get um, to understand some of the underlying physics behind the bioinformatics. Sometimes it's helpful just to take a paper that you're interested in and read some of the, um, the references or some of the um, underlying methodology 
so you find a paper that you're interested in and you see some methodology, then go back to your textbooks and learn a little bit more from the methodology um, that's in the paper. Um, or you could always take a, a class in physics, although they tend to be fairly um, not completely relevant to the paper that you're reading. Um, so that, that would be my suggestion. Okay, here is one that is more uh, current, okay? Um, what type of information is available in association with online edge COVID, COVID samples? For example, is there specific phenotypic information like GI or cardiovascular symptoms and the severity or medications that patients were on prior to infection such as ACE inhibitor? Is there uh, prote proteomic or RNA sequence data associated with the historic, uh, histo histological samples you mentioned? That is, um, that is a great question because COVID-19 is such a hydra of um, disease, it's, it, it's been hard for us to get our hands around it. So we're looking at making and understanding some of the very basic underlying electronic healthcare record data that will tell you about medications, about prior um, conditions um, available, but in a, in a de-identified way so that you wouldn't be able to trace it back to a particular individual, but you could look at correlations from what is presented um, in the patient who has COVID-19 when they enter the hospital um, with respect to what they have um, taken in terms of drugs or in terms of prior conditions. In terms of proteomics and sequences, we have much less data on that. Um, it's, it's hard to get those data. Um, the healthcare system tends to be a little bit um, taxed. And so getting right now getting proteomic samples is um, been more challenging and we are just now getting sequencing samples um, from COVID-19 patients. Putting all that information together is our, is our kind of grand challenge at this point. We think that we can make some of the data available. Um, it's, as you can tell, it's coming in in a staged way because we have the um, pathology images available right now. We don't even have the CT images available for researchers. They're in the queue. They need to be de-identified. They need to be um, associated with appropriate um, standards and metadata so that you can use them. So that's even getting those CT um, images is taking a long time. Getting the other data like the electronic healthcare record data de-identified, um, we hope we can get that done by this summer, but it's gonna take some time. And the sequencing data, that might be even longer. So you can see the struggles that we have um, just to get the data out for researchers to use. Great. What do you think of current state-of-the-art research on protein structural prediction? Oh, <laughs> so I do have a favorite. Um, and I, I've been involved in um, protein structure um, determination and prediction for a while um, in terms of determining the structures. Certainly x-ray scattering was um, a popular deter way to determine structure for many, many years. I certainly worked in, in x-ray structure um, as well as neutron scattering, which is not as refined as x-ray. Now we see cryo-EM um, blossoming into a real serious research tool for actual atom-specific structures. In comparison, also in protein structure prediction, there was the, um, I don't know if you're familiar with CAS, Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction, competition that was run every two years. Um, so I don't know what number we're up to now, but um, when I was working on it, um, people were doing homology modeling. So taking a, a standard and trying to align an unknown sequence to that standard, they were working on um, threading. Um, I did a lot of threading. I did a lot of genetic algorithm for stru protein structure predictions, some molecular dynamics. And then um, there was the work by David Baker, um, which looked at little tiny windows of protein and mapping them um, onto um, existing structures. Uh, and that approach seems to have been quite successful. I think the field is still moving in that direction of um, sort of micro-threading. I, I, um, I cannot believe I forgot Rosetta. <laughs> Rosetta, that was his program. Um, 
I think the field had really pushed forward with his, with his revolutionary work in Rosetta. And now I imagine that what's happening is uh, much more um, looking um, at uh, artificial intelligence to gain information about prior structures to um, even move further into what those structure, new structures might be. So ab initio protein structure prediction, I think the door really opened up with David Baker's work. But prior to that, there was an awful lot of BLAST type based algorithms. Yeah, as we get closer to the end of the hour, uh, the questions are getting more futuristic, right? Here's one. Do you think physically writing code will be less important in five to 10 years? When you can use platforms like Galaxy for basic and the translation of biological research? Actually, I think you're kind of right. I think that people are um, producing codelets, little micro bits of code that can be swapped in and out in a modular way. And so, you know, my old way of taking a giant code and I had to work on um, Charm, which is fairly huge, uh, and trying to add subroutines to it will change to micro um, code and codelets where you just swap out little bits. And so that the idea of Galaxy and platform based coding is probably going to be uh, much more standard for many, many folks um, in the future. I, I think that, um, you know, computer science is moving in really interesting and fun directions. And I, and I look forward to um, watching what you guys do. Good. Um, here's a question. Is there any online training courses that include, that include biophysics branch of bioinformatics? I guess it's including biophysics of bioinformatics? Um, gosh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I think, I would think so, but off the top of my head, I don't, I don't have those um, online courses. Although I do know that um, through NIGMS, we have funded a number of big data uh, online training MOOCs, I guess, online training courses. Um, and so uh, through the societies, there's definitely training courses. So the biophysics, biophysical society would be a great place to look for those online training courses in biophysics. Um, Are there more questions? I'll wait a little bit. Going once, going twice, three times. Thank you so much, Susan. This this is a fantastic hour. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to tell you about um, my personal journey in data science, computational science, and where we are now with COVID-19. And I hope that you will um, take the opportunity to look at the online training resources that are available and also look at our website and do participate in any one of these um, training opportunities offered through our Strides partnerships with AWS and Google or through our NCBI um, uh, courses and webinars and through the NIAID bioinformatics training resources. All right, thank you all. Um, stay safe and be well. Thank you.